and I'm going to begin reading at verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined for to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. <coughs> and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the prices, prices of the things that were sold, laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distri distribution was made to every man according as he had need. Shortly after Pentecost, Peter and John went up to the temple in Jerusalem to pray. On the, their way, the lame man who was laying at the gate called Beautiful asked for alms for the apostles. I'm sure that this man laid there many times when Jesus went into the temple. I'm sure that when Jesus walked to the temple that this man was laying there because he was a man that was above 40 years old. So I'm sure that he was laying there when Jesus walked by him. Why didn't Jesus heal him? I mean, these are questions that come to my mind. Why, why was he still laying there when Peter and John came into the temple years later? You know, why, what, what was the purpose of Jesus bypassing this man and not, and not healing him? A lot of questions, you know, we'll have to wait till we get over there to find out the answer to because I, I, don't, I don't know why other than the fact that Jesus you know, wanted them to do it. But Jesus did do it through them. Right. And that was the promotion of them as far as spreading his word. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, that's a good thought. Did he not no, ask? no, 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 no. <laughs> did he not ask? Huh? Did the guy not ask? Well, to that's be a healed? possibility too. He may, he may never have asked for alms. He might have just been laying there and and uh, not responding to anything. It's very possible. You know, I mean, <clears throat> naturally, in, in fact, let me, let me insert this lest I forget it. I said this before, God only answers prayers that people pray. Ask and you shall receive. If you don't ask, you're not going to get. <laughs> Bottom line. So, you know, you have to come to God in prayer. You've got to... You've got to ask him. So he asked of alms from the apostles. Paul, Peter's response was, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Peter took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and the man began leaping and praising God. This man was above 40 years old who had never walked. And so you know that you don't just start walking. First of all, you crawl. Then you pull yourself up. I'm talking about a little child. Pull yourself up. You hold on to something. And you take a few staggering steps. And yeah. you, you certainly don't just start 
running. You don't start leaping. But this man did. It's, it caused quite a stir and a large crowd gathered around to witness the miracle which had taken place. Peter took advantage of the occasion and preached to the people. And the Bible says about 5,000 men believed in Christ. And of course, 5,000 men, we don't know how many uh, families were there, women and children. We don't know how many uh, others received uh, God that day. While Peter was preaching, the rulers of the synagogue came and arrested him and John and held them overnight. The next morning, the apostles were brought before the council to defend their action. Peter answered the charges and explained that the lame man was healed through the power of Christ. <clears throat> council decided privately to threaten them and forbid them to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Peter's response, he told the council that they could decide for themselves whether it would be better to listen to God or to them. But he and John intended to keep on witnessing what they had seen and heard. When the apostles were dismissed, they returned to their friends and fellow believers. That brings us to the passage that we read in your hearing this morning. When you read through the book of Acts, you begin to understand that the New Testament church went from one crisis to another. Mm -hmm. I want you to think about that. I want you to hear what I just said. They went from one crisis to another. They went through from one storm to another storm. You know, we, we don't like storms. We don't like to think about, you know, going through stuff. <clears throat> but the early church did. But they were always victorious. They were never under their circumstances. They were never overcome by what they were going through. What was the key to their victory? What was it that caused them to always be victorious? What in mind? Christ and uh, their beliefs in Him that always led them through. Because they know there was always a better side no matter what happened. It's absolutely true that it was through Christ and, and that's definitely how it happened. But something caused that to happen, Dennis. There, there was something on their part that caused that to happen. It didn't just take place. It, I mean, even though, and, and, and you know, God can do anything and will do anything and does do so much that we don't understand, but something causes that. Listen to me. There's cause and effect to everything that happens in life. Amen. Nothing just happens. Something makes it happen. Yes. They're walking in the Holy Ghost. I mean, simply walking in the power of God. And that's, that's also true. That, that's absolutely true. <clears throat> but just walking in God's power doesn't cause what just happened to happen. You had a hand? Yes, I did. Is it possible that the Lord gave Peter the keys to the kingdom and he took that serious and he knew that he had an obligation or a desire to complete what the Lord had given him. And he had his mind and his desire set a split and they knew the purpose. Alright, that's a good answer also, but not the answer I'm looking for. Everybody say cause and effect. Cause and effect. <coughs> I'm going to say a word that seems like we struggle with in today's church. <clears throat> what was it that caused them to always walk in victory? They had a prayer life. They had a they were in touch with the master. And so it was their prayer and, and somebody already said, you know, they didn't ask. The man didn't ask, perhaps. And, and it's, it's through prayer that things happen and that things take place. The church in the book of Acts was a praying church. 
verse 24 through 30 contains the record of the church's prayer on this occasion. And I absolutely love this, this uh, what the scripture says about their prayer. Absolutely love what is said. Look at verse 24 and we'll look at uh, through 30. And when they had heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, Thou art God. It's good once in a while to let Him know who He is. Acts chapter 4. It's good to remind God, Lord, I, I don't serve Jehovah Junior. I'm not praying to somebody that's inadequate or infeminate or not able to move. I'm talking to the God of the universe. I'm talking to the one that spoke and the world came into existence. I'm talking to the living God. I'm not talking to Buddha. I'm not talking to Confucius. I'm not talking to somebody that can't answer my prayer. Amen. Amen. Lord, Thou art God. I think he likes to hear that. I think somebody needs to tell him, Lord, You're God. Lord, You're God. Praise God. We, we need to recognize that and we need to confess that and we need to tell Him. And the Bible said they did that with one accord. Lord, Thou art God. Watch this. Which has made heaven and earth. Lord, it, that, it didn't just happen that the heaven and earth showed up. You're the maker. You are the one that made it. The sea and all that is in, in them is who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. I want you to know that hasn't changed. I want you to know that, that the rulers of this world, uh, the leaders of these countries and the, and the people, the mentality of this world is still against Christ. You know, you can talk about anything you want to talk about. You can talk about, you know, Confucius or Buddha or, or, or whatever you want to talk about. But don't say anything about Jesus. You know, they told me, I, I'm a chaplain, or I'm not anymore because I don't go to their meetings. But, but uh, I was a chaplain for uh, many years of the, uh, from its inception of the Marine Corps League here in Bangor. They wanted me to be the chaplain for the state. And, and I, w I wouldn't do it because... Uh, you know, the Bible says, let the dead bury the dead. And that's what the chaplain does, is has funerals. So, I wasn't interested in, in a full-time job of burying people. But, you know, they, they said, now, uh, Reverend, you, you can pray, and we want you to pray. They gave me a big gold cross. It's about that thick, arms and, and that, you know, and they wanted me to dangle that over my neck and and stand up, you know, and, and, and read a prayer uh, to, you know, to them. And, and, uh, but what you can't do is don't, don't pray in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I said, I laughed at him. I said, I'm a Jesus name preacher. Amen. You know, I'm a one God apostolic. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get up here and read your prayer. If you want me to be your chaplain, I'll be your chaplain. But, but I'm not going to wear that gold cross, number one, because I don't serve a God that's on the cross anymore. He, he was on that cross once, but He's not there now. And, and I'm not going to pray to a God that's, that's dead. He's a living God. And neither am I going to, you know, I'm going to end my prayer in the name of Jesus. And what's funny to me, well, it's not really funny. It's sad, really, but odd, maybe I should say, is that people want to pray and they want to say whatever, you know, Father, blah, 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 but in Jesus' name. Because right. if you're going to get anything done, you've got to come right. to Jesus and, and, right. and call upon His name. Yeah, because He is the God of all power. Right, right. He is the God that created. Just like they prayed that early church prayed. God, you're the one that made it. You made the heaven and the earth. You made the sea and everything that's in them. <clears throat> And then he goes on, talks about verse 26, how they're all gathered together. And then verse 27, for of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, 
whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together against him. <clears throat> For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings unto thy servants, that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Yeah. By stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. Lord, Lord, let miracles and signs and wonders be done in thy name. And so, you know how that uh, they pray. The remainder of the chapter cites the results that the church experienced. The rest of that chapter. From these verses, we expect a church to experience, that prays to experience certain things. God hasn't changed. So the first thing I want to talk about is that when you pray, God answers. In fact, I am convinced God doesn't do anything today but answer prayer. When He hung on Calvary, He said it's finished. So what God does today is answer prayer. A praying church may expect God to give exclusive evidence that he heard and answered their prayer. When you pray for the sick, you can expect them to be healed. Exactly. Yes, Praise God. When yes. you pray for an unborn child, you can expect that child, no matter the doctor said the child's not going to live, you can expect that child to live. Oh, preacher, come on. I prayed for things and I haven't got it. God hasn't answered the way I, I thought he should. I prayed for somebody to live and they died. It is appointed to man once to die. There is a sickness that is unto death. Yes. But you still pray because you don't know where that sickness is and you don't know when it is. But God does. Yes. But if you don't pray for sure... You know, you have no hope. You have no promise. <clears throat> In verse 30, the Bible says the church prayed for signs and wonders be done by the name of Jesus, and God responded immediately. Immediately. By shaking the place where they were assembled. Verse 31 tells us that. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were, I like this, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Wow. Wow. They all didn't just get a blessing. They all didn't just get a goose, some goosebumps. They all were filled with the Holy Ghost. Wouldn't that be awesome if that happened this morning? Amen. Yes. You say, oh, that's, that's impossible. There's all kinds of people here this morning. There's all kinds of thoughts here this morning. There's all kinds of people planning to watch the ball drop, drop on New Year's. Uh, and, and there's all kinds of things that are going to happen, you know. Uh, there's things to drink and things to eat and things to do and blah, blah, blah. You know, so it's impossible for that to happen today. Well, you asked a question earlier about how those guys walked in victory consistently. I personally believe in my own life, the only way I walk in victory is knowing what God has done for my life. It's how I can walk in victory to victory is knowing what God did for me last year or 10 minutes ago and know that it is the hand of God, that it's not just my intuition or what I really want. So I honestly believe that they, they were unlearned and ignorant fishermen, and they knew that the master had touched their life. Mm -hmm. Unlearned and ignorant. Those are the people that pray. Because we know we need prayer. <laughs> Amen. That's who God chose. And, and I probably will come to that down down in this lesson, you know, that, that 
God can't answer somebody's prayers because their, their prayers are too high up and too far beyond where God is. I love this story of answered prayer. Shortly after Dallas Theological Seminary was founded in 1924, it almost came to the point of bankruptcy. All the creditors were going to foreclose at noon on a particular day. That morning they met at the president's office for prayer <clears throat> that God would provide. In that prayer meeting was a man by the name of Harry Ironside. When it was his turn to pray, <clears throat> he said, Lord, we know that the cattle on a thousand hills are yours, are thine. Please tell some of, somebody to sell some of them and give us some money. <laughs> well, no, that's kind of a, a far-fetched. This is a true story. That's kind of a far-fetched prayer. Tell somebody to tell, sell some of them and give us some money. While they were praying, everybody say, while they were praying. A tall Texan stepped up to the business office and said, I just sold two carloads of cattle in Fort Worth. I've been trying to make a business deal, <clears throat> but it fell through. And something compelled me to give the money to the seminary. I don't know if you need it or not, but here's the check. The secretary took the check, knowing how critical things were financially, went to the door of the prayer meeting and tapped on the door. When she finally got a response, the president took the check out of her hand and it was exactly for the amount of the debt. When he looked at the name, he recognized the cattleman and returned to, turning to Dr. Ironside said, Harry, God sold the cattle. <laughs> so, the first thing a praying church can expect is that God is a prayer answering God. Right. Yes, he is. When you pray, expect God to answer. Yes. That's right. Hallelujah. You've got to anticipate God answering. A praying church, number two, is also it's a spirit filled church. A praying church may expect the Holy Ghost to come down in the meetings. The Bible says, and when they had prayed, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. That was not the first or last time that the Spirit came on the early church in that manner. So then, any praying church may expect outpourings of the Holy Ghost on a regular basis. I don't ever want to come to church where there's people that have needs and the needs not met. I, 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 don't, I don't want to attend that type of church. I want to hear where God answers prayer. And God answers prayer many times that people don't give Him thanks. They don't give Him praise. They don't respond to that. Uh, that, it realized that this happened because I pray. Uh, there's so many things that happen right now, today, that you don't realize are happening, but they're answers to prayer. They're answers to prayer. So a praying church can expect outpourings of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost comes to our meetings only in response to prayer. If you're content to be dry and prayerless, you'll live careless, you won't live in victory, you won't walk in faith, because you have to pray to have faith. God only comes where He's invited. Only comes where He's invited. After you pray comes the power. In a magazine some time ago, there appeared an article about the installation of a new organ in New York City Church. It was a rare and costly instrument. Its many pipes were capable of pouring out glorious melodies. However, 
The first Sunday it was used, the current was somehow cut off early in the service. The organist was helpless to do anything about it. A call for help was made. Soon an electrician was on the scene. He made a quick investigation, saw that the problem could easily be fixed. A note was hurriedly passed to the organist. After prayer, the power will be back on. <laughs> oh, that, 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 just, that just happened. That, that, that wasn't a preacher that said that. That was an electrician, that did, a, a workman just come along. He said, but, but you know, in other words, you're going you're gonna to have prayer. You're going to start prayer. Go ahead and have prayer. And as soon as the prayer is done, by the time the praying is done, the power will be back on. <laughs> You see, a church that works without prayer may have a lot of activity, a lot of things happening, but it will exhibit little power. Dr. A.C. Dixon was right when he said, when we rely on organization, we get what organization can do. When we rely on education, we get what education can do. When we rely on eloquence, we get what eloquence can do. But when we rely on prayer, we get what God can do. How important is prayer? How necessary is prayer? Number three, a praying church will have powerful preaching. In the third place, a praying church may expect the Word of God to be preached and taught with authority and boldness. Look at verse 29. Grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. <coughs> they didn't skirt the issues of their day. They stayed in the Bible. I couldn't tell you how many times somebody's told me, why don't you leave the Bible out of it? That's the only thing I have. I, you know, out of this conversation and talking to to someone about the Lord. You know, you know, why do you always hide behind the scriptures? I don't hide behind the scriptures. The scriptures is all you have. Why do you use so much Bible to establish? Because the Bible is the power of God. That's where the power is at. Yes. <clears throat> they stayed in the Word. A praying church can expect the Word of God to have preeminence in its pulpit and classroom. It's been said that preachers make churches. But I also believe that churches make preachers. I, I don't believe that, that a preacher can go any higher than a praying church and, and a people that pray for their pastor. I, I don't believe that I can do anything or be anything that people don't pray for God to do. God anoint the pastor. Anoint let the Holy Ghost use him. Let the Holy Ghost flow through him. Help me, Lord God, to, to focus on he's a man just like any other man is without the anointing of God. But with the anointing of God, it totally changes. But that don't just happen. That happens through prayer. A praying church, number four, is a soul-winning church. Somebody say soul winning. soul winning. A praying church may expect to be a soul winning church. Verse 32 indicates that the early church had prayed a multitude of people through to the Holy Ghost. When the Bible says a multitude, the reason it says a multitude, there's too many people to count. And so it's just a multitude. They couldn't count how many people were a part of that church. In one place, the Bible says, these that have turned the world upside down have come to us. <clears throat> that early church turned their world upside down, which is right side up. And that's what should be said about this church. Apostolic Lighthouse Church turned Bangor, Maine upside down. And I believe that's going to happen. Amen. I believe that's going to happen yeah. in 2019. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Because we are going to focus on the basics. We're going to focus on what that early church 
focused on, and that was prayer. Now, I'm not talking about a Saturday night prayer meeting, as you'll see tonight. I'll, I'll, I'll be presenting tonight what's going to happen as far as prayer goes and what I'm looking for as far as prayer goes. But we're going to change this city. Amen. We're going to change us. The change has to begin with us yes. and in us. Yes. As a church member whose members will unite their prayers and lift up their voices to God with one accord on behalf of lost souls, you can expect God to hear and answer and give them souls. They were praying where to go to church. <clears throat> when I was Sunday school director back in the 70s, I taught a soul winning class. Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday till noon. Here in the state of Maine. I asked who would promise me they would bring somebody to church the next day, which was Sunday. Nobody raised a hand. Pastor was down on the front row and I walked down to him and asked him, brother, and I called his name. I said, I just taught Thursday, Friday, Saturday till noon and you never even raised your hand that you would bring somebody to Sunday school tomorrow. I said, what? I handed him the mic and he said, well, I can't guarantee you that I'll have somebody to Sunday school tomorrow. What happened? I got very, very angry. Betty Cole said that's the gift of faith in operation. He said faith, God's faith always gets angry. <laughs> and I got, I got angry. I said, I don't know anybody in your town. I, I don't know one soul in your town. But I promise you, tomorrow, there'll be somebody in your church because I prayed. Mm. And I, I left. Here, brother, I, I want to pay. I, you know, keep your money. Your money perish with you. Yeah, you know, forget that. I don't need your money. And so, I got in my car. My wife got in. And we drove down the street, pulled to the side of the road, and began to pray. And I said, Jesus, you know how mad I am right now. I've been biting nails right now. I am so angry. I've wasted your time and my time. You know, teaching these people that don't want to do nothing. They want to sit around and, and coast into heaven. Uh, yeah. Rather than understanding if you're going to heaven, you've got to climb. There's a, there's a battle to fight. There's war to rage. And you've got to do something. You can't just coast into heaven. You can't rest on an experience you had. 25, 30, 40 years ago. You've got to understand. You've got to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Fresh Holy Ghost. Fresh fire. And I said, Jesus, I am so mad that I've wasted your time. Forgive me for that. And I said, now, Lord, I need your help because I don't know anybody in this town. But you know everybody. You know where people are right now in this town that are praying. You know where people are searching for you. They are in your word. They're trying to find truth. I'm going to pause right there. Paul, let you testify that testimony. You don't have to name the church. <coughs> that, that testimony you gave me last night. You were in a church. Don't, don't, don't say the church. Well, uh, before I came to church here, and I was searching for God, uh, I went to a church in this city. I went there a number of times. I even got baptized there. And... Uh, the last time I was there, I, was, I always sat in the back because I came in late because of my job on Sunday morning. And I was sitting there, and it was during the worship service, and in, it was a very, it's a very large church. And there was a lot of people, probably 400 people in, in the auditorium. And, uh, and in the far right corner towards the front of the auditorium, you know what a, a Fourth of July sparkler looks like, right? Well, I was sitting there, and all of a sudden, there was like this big sparkler that was about, I don't know, bigger than a basketball, bigger than that, but, and it was, and it started going back and forth across the top of, about this high above the people's heads, and it was almost an audible voice I could hear saying, is there anybody here who will worship me? And, um, and nobody was responding to it, obviously, I could see it, visibly, 
I could see it. And when it and it, and I was waiting for it to come back to me, and because I was watching the, the the crowd and nobody was responding. And when it got when it came across my road, a fr just in front of me, and when it got right in front of me, I said, "I'll worship you," and it disappeared. And uh, and that was the last time I went there, and I believe it was in March of eight, nine, 1982. And uh, in May of 1982, I sat in with a Bible study with Ed and Brother Updike and repented, and two weeks later I got the Holy Ghost here. I told that last night, and I got goosebumps as he was telling that, because I don't think that's just a thing that happens once in a while. I think God speaks to people before they ever come to Him. In fact, it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. It's God's goodness that leads us to repentance. So before anybody ever gets baptized or gets a Holy Ghost, God's Spirit is dealing with them and leading them and will show them things that happen. <clears throat> I don't want to get sidetracked because uh, I, I, I'm going somewhere. I don't want to get sidetracked either, but I had a similar experience, and I can I can name the church that's gone now. It was a Methodist. I don't want to have All right, never mind. But it wasn't here. It was in Detroit. And I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at the sunlight come in the stained glass windows, and, and I'm thinking about God, and up front they're saying stuff, and I couldn't even make out what they were saying. And... God spoke to me and said, "Yep, I'm God. I'm, but I'm not here. You know, I'm looking at God. I'm looking at the sun coming through the window and thinking about God and thinking that God has His hand on that and He's doing that. And God, God said, yep, but I'm not here. And I never went back. So I started driving." Some of you have heard this before because I've told it just recently because God's been dealing with me about prayer. So, as I'm driving, I'm praying, and I see a bunch of two or three wagons and some bicycles, and I thought, man, there's a gold mine right there. <laughs> Listen to me. Anybody with an ounce of God can get a child to come to church. Anybody. In fact, you don't even need the Holy Ghost to get somebody to come to church, a child. Parents are so willing for free babysitting. You say, well, that, that, that's a, not a good reason. To, that's a very good reason to get children to come to church. Who cares why parents let them come? Children grow up. Now, they don't give much tithe. They, they, don't, they don't put much in the offering. But they're souls that are going to spend eternity somewhere. Right. And anybody can get a soul to come, a child to come. Right. I used to make preachers mad. In fact, I had a preacher drop out of UPC because he got so mad at me because... I said, give them bicycles. Give them candy. Give them whatever kind of bait you need to put on the line. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. I, I am not a fisherman. Gene's a fisherman. Amen. Tim's a fisherman. Those guys are fishermen. I'm not. But I know this much about fishing. You don't fish with a bare hook. All right. That's true. So this preacher said, Brother Hurst is baiting kids. He turned his card in, got out of the organization. He was out of the organization for years. He's dead and gone now. He was out of the organization for years. One day I was out walking in the mall, and uh, my wife and I, and I run into him and his wife. He was walking, his wife was sitting, so my wife sat down with her, and I began walking with him. And I started doing that several times a week. Whenever he was walking, I found out I'd walk with him. That's when I found out how he'd been angry at me for all this time. He had been the previous Sunday school director and didn't do nothing. And it was mad that somebody would come from Ohio and 
and, and churches would start to grow and people would start to come in and, and it bothered him. If I can't win them, nobody's going to have them. If you can't go to heaven from here, go somewhere else. I want you saved. Somebody say, well, the church can't survive without me. The church can survive. It can survive without me. Amen. You know, hey, it's God's church. It's not mine. God's church will survive. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the, the church. So the church is going to make it, whether you make it or not. But you have to come to understand that God has a church here for one purpose. That's to reach... Bangor, right. to reach the city. You know, it shouldn't be city reach that's got people coming to it. It shouldn't be this reach or that reach or the outreach or whatever. Uh, they all should have people coming to them, but we should be doing our part to fill this building to capacity. You say, well, then we'll have to build. Yeah, yeah, we will. It's coming. Right. Yeah, yeah, we will. You've heard it all this time. Yes. Probably the Amen. first message I preached when I came to Bangor, get in, get out, or get run over. Right. <laughs> you know, down on Lincoln Street. You, you've got to make up your mind you're going to live for God. Right. You know, and from the, the book of Kings where this, this guy, the prophet, prophesied and said, or the, the <laughs> leper said, you know, that this is going to happen. And, and the prophet said, yeah, and tomorrow this is going to happen. And, and the guy that leaned on the king's... Uh, Bosom said, if God would open the windows of heaven, that cannot happen. And that I, from that text, I preached, get in or get out or get run over because the next day he got run over with the crowd of people that yep. came, you know, yes, and sir. died un underfoot because he, he didn't believe God. He didn't believe the Word of God. Yes. Anyway, God said no. Wagons and bikes and all of that. I drove a little farther. Looked at my watch. Man, I'm running out of time here because I was quite a ways from Bangor. Running out of time. I saw some more bikes and wagons and things and I said, there. Pulled over and God said no. I said, unbelievable. I drove on. Looked to my left. And God said, there, probably the prettiest house in this town, set up on a hill, beautiful brick home, big brick home, lights along the driveway, up, up to the house, and a beautiful house. And God said, there, I didn't see no bikes, I didn't see no wagons, I didn't see no trash out in the yard. I said, God, are you sure? <laughs> And I said, of course, of course, you're God. And so I drove up the driveway, walked up to the door, and rang the doorbell. Man came to the door with an open Bible in his hand. His Bible open. I said, sir, I'm an apostolic preacher, and God just told me that there's somebody here that's looking for him. Tears shot out of his eyes. He said, come in. Come in, preacher. He gulped. I stepped into his house. Around a table was 11 other people with Bibles open. They were having a Bible study. They said, we just left this church down. And they told me the church they had left. And he said, uh, because, you know, this happened, that happened, the other thing happened. So we left there. And we were just praying Everybody say, God answers prayer. God. We were just praying where we should go to church tomorrow. And I said, well, I came to tell you where. God sent me to tell you where to go tomorrow. And I gave them the address of that church. And 12 people went to that church that had about 10 people in it. 12 praying people showed up the next day. Four of them were business people. The dad and his sons were a construction company. So they owned a business and all kinds of equipment. They 
went to that church. Years have gone by. The preacher is no longer there. Whether those people still go there, I don't go there to church, so I don't know whether they still go there or not. But I do know this. They went to church for several weeks, months, years after that. At that church where the preacher said, I'm not sure I can get anybody to come tomorrow or not. I'm telling you, you can get anybody to come to church. You can get somebody to come to church if you pray. How many of you remember Morse and Sally? Morse and Sally had been divorced several, several times. Sally's husband, uh, previous husband, was a uh, Sunday school superintendent in a church here in Bangor and uh, had committed adultery. She divorced him. Morris had been divorced twice. And uh, so uh, Brother Hennigan and I were at a, at a prayer conference down in, down in uh, the arena, the old arena. It was packed. We were sitting back in a crowd. Sitting back in a crowd. And this healer said, <coughs> on my right in the back is somebody that's got a pain in your back. If you'll come up here right now, Jesus will heal you. About 20 people got up. And I can say that today. I mean, you know, anybody's got any pain in your back, stand up. And there'll be people stand up today. But anyway, I'm not going to do that. So, so these people got up and they started up, up through one of them was Sally Curtis. And Sally had a lot of problems. She'd been in a car wreck. She'd had her back broken and she and in a lot of pain. And so, but we, Brother Hennig and I were standing there together. We joined hands. I said, let's pray. And this was our prayer, or my prayer. I said, Jesus, Lord, and that's 20 people. There's got to be one honest soul that's really seeking you. Help them, Lord, to come to us. Sally walks up by the, pe the people that were praying, come back to the aisle, down to, and she crawled over some people, came into us, stopped between, uh, right in front of Brother Hennigan and I. She said, I don't know why I came to you, but when I walked across the front of that building, something spoke to me, a voice spoke and said, keep walking, I'll show you where to stop. She came right up and stood in front of us. I said, I told her my name, who I was, and I said, uh, I, will, I will come and, and I got her address. I said, I'll come and visit you tomorrow, my wife and I. So we went to visit them, and uh, they owned a boarding home at the time. We went to visit them, and, and uh, she said, I'll come tomorrow. She never came. Six months, a year later, I was laying carpet, putting carpet on some steps in a house out beyond Dysart's. And unbeknownst to me, it was her son, unbeknownst to me at that time. And I said, uh, he asked if we wanted a drink and, and uh, a beer or something. I said, well, I don't do beer, but I'd, I'd take a Pepsi or something if you got it. He said, yeah, I'll get you a Pepsi. So he got me a Pepsi. And I can't remember who helped me. Maybe Ed might have been Ed. I don't know who was helping me, but somebody was helping. Dennis might have been you. <laughs> I don't remember who was helping me, but we, we uh, sat down on the steps and opened our soda and began to drink. And I said to him, I said, what does a clean-cut young man like you, where did you go to church? He said, I don't. And I said, uh, wow. I said, tell me about that. He said... My father was a Sunday school director in a, he told me the church, and he said uh, he committed adultery with one of the women in the church, and so, you know, I, I quit going to church a long time ago. I said, I know your mother. He said, you do? I told him her name. He said, that is my mother. How do you know her? I said, because God just told me that he's dealing with her. He's been dealing with her for over a year. So I said, I'm going to go visit your mother tomorrow. So my wife and I went the next day, Saturday, and visited 
that house again. She said, I didn't know anything about Brother Curtis. She said, come up, come up uh, stairs and uh, I, I want you to meet Morris. That's all she said. So we went upstairs. She said, would you like a cup of coffee? I said, yes. Sit down. Sit down on the seat. She says, brings you coffee. I took one sip of it. I said, sir, you're hungry for God. You've been looking for God all around the world. You're a military man. You, your background is military. And I said, you've been seeking for God for years. And, and, and God just sent me by here to tell you why you haven't found Him. He took a sip of his coffee and he said, Why? I said, Because you're shacking up with this woman. My wife had taken a sip of her soda and she spit it out. And he said, he gulped and he said, Where is your church? And I told him, and they never missed another service. They never missed another service. They came, and, and, and uh, they weren't married. They were shacking up. And so, so you know, they, they, come, they come to church, and, and, uh, and people were calling them uh, Brother and Sister Sally. <laughs> or Brother and Sister Curtis. Because the kids didn't know anybody. They didn't know that they were not married. <laughs> they were calling them Brother and Sister Curtis. So I set up a Bible study, and we started doing Bible study. And, and uh, so I said to him, I said, uh, you guys need to get married. And Sally started crying. She said, Brother Hurst, Morris will never, he's had so many, two bad experiences in marriage. He'll never marry, he'll never get married. And so I said, Sally, before my birthday, Morris is going to ask you to marry him. <laughs> She said, he'll never marry me, blah, blah, blah. My birthday's February 5th. February the 4th, she called me. 3 o'clock in the morning. Guess what, brothers, guess what? I said, Morse just asked you to marry him. She said, how did you know? I said, because tomorrow's my birthday. <laughs> I told you that was going to happen. <laughs> and so, Morris had asked her to marry him. And so... When we had their, their wedding, some of you were there, I'm sure. But when we had that wedding, uh, Louise Morshead was the, working at the Eastern Maine Hospital, one of the nurses, supervisors or something up there. And, and she said, uh, uh, so she was Sally's uh, matron of honor. And she came and they were, she was standing out in the wing. And Sally said, Pastor, I want you to tell the people, because I've got a lot of my grandchildren here, I want you to tell them the truth of why why we're getting married. We're, we're turning our life to God. We're going to do right. We're going to live right. And so I, I want you to tell, them, uh, to tell them the truth. And I said, well, you want me to tell them nice or you want me to tell them plain? She said, tell them plain. Plain. And, and I don't know how many doctors were there. There were, there were several doctors there. And I said, I said, uh, uh, told him about them coming to God and, and, and God <laughs> fell in with the Holy Ghost and so forth. And I said, uh, I, I, was, I got, you know, how to do marriages here and all that, but I said, Sally wants me to tell you plainly. Now, Louise is standing up by the door that came in up there. She was standing by that door outside. And I said, uh, Morse and Sally have been shacking up for many years. And it got quiet. <laughs> And Louise told me later, she said, I almost passed out. <laughs> she said, that, to think that I was going to step out that door and say I knew this woman. <laughs> and I said, you know, and, and they just want you, you to know that uh, they're going to make their lives right with God. And, and they're going to get married. And, and that's the, the purpose of getting married. So they're going to get married. And, and, and it's going to work out. Why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all this because I used to pray... Uh, in the morning, early in the morning, and, and I still pray. Uh, I'm getting back to that kind of prayer where God give me direction today. The steps of a good man are order of the Lord. Order my steps today. I don't want to just take up space. I don't want to waste the remainder of my lifetime 
in, in a city right, where right. nobody wants God. There are people here that want God. Yeah. And, and Lord, help me to find them. You know, but, but I am not going to do that by myself. God has placed you in this, in this church for a purpose. So that you can reach people. So that you can touch people's lives. And I said, anybody that don't even have the Holy Ghost can get somebody to come to church. Anybody. Anyway, that, so... The multitude of the, those that believed were of one heart and one soul. They had purpose in their heart that we are going to do the will of God. Nothing can unite people like praying together and praying for one another. In fact, Paul said, God forbid that I should sin in ceasing to pray for you. Wow. I don't have to smoke. I don't have to chew. I don't have to go with girls that do. I don't have to do any of that garbage. Uh, you know, all I got to do is not pray for you. Lord, mercy. To think that you're so unimportant, your soul is so valueless that I don't need to pray for you. And I don't mean just as a pastor. I mean that's to every saint of God that you are to be praying for one another. People are going through stuff today. Going through the fire today. I hugged Jim Evans last night. It was up to his memorial. And I hugged him as I was leaving. I said, Jimmy, I want you to know that I'm praying for you, buddy. And he held me tight and he said, I know, Brother Hurst, I, I know you prayed for me. And I said, you just don't know how much. You know, God's coming, bud. God's about to come. We've got to understand yes. that the end is coming. And we've got to get ready to meet our Maker. That's right. <clears throat> This is what Jesus prayed for on the night before His crucifixion, right before He died. Father, sanctify them that they might be one, even as we are one. You in me and I in them, that they might be perfect in one. A united church is not happenstance. A united church is not an accident. They lifted up their voices with one accord. Look at verse 32 again. No one said that any of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had everything common. In other words, everything they owned was consecrated to God. He was the owner. They were the stewards. <clears throat> I'm going to break from that <clears throat> for a minute and look at Acts chapter 5. <clears throat> now they had just prayed for miracle signs and wonders to happen. Look at Acts chapter 5. But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira with his wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being private to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in thy own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto me, or to men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, gave up the ghost. Watch this. And great fear, great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young man arose, wound him up, carried him out, buried him. About the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yea, for so much. Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry you out. Then she fell down straight well at his feet and yielded up the ghost. The young men came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Now remember, this is Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 4 is when they prayed that miracle signs and wonders would be done. Yeah. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest, durst no man join himself to them. But the people magnified them. 
In other words, nobody dared just come to church to take up space. Nobody dared to come to church to play church. They didn't dare to walk into that apostolic church, that first apostolic church, and, and just expect business as usual. But I like this verse 14. And believers were the more added to the Lord. Watch this. Multitudes. In other words, such a crowd couldn't be counted. Both men and women. Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the street, laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. <clears throat> and they brought... Oh, let me go. They came also a multitude. Again, countless group. Out of the city round about unto Jerusalem, saying, uh, bringing sick folk and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed 95%. Everyone. 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 They were healed. That early church was a healing church because it was a praying church. There was miracles, signs, and wonders because they asked God, Lord, glorify Yourself. Let this happen. Let miracles, signs, and wonders happen. Hallelujah. Lord, I don't want to just come to church with business as usual. I want to see, I want to see walkers thrown out and hung on the wall somewhere. I need, to, I need some people that will get a hold of God and intercede for people that need prayer, that need healing, that need a touch of God in their life. I read this story about a lady going to her pastor one day and said, uh, God's been so good to me, pastor. If you know anyone who's in need of some financial assistance, please let me know and I'll do what I can to help. The only condition is that no one knows who the donor is. Uh, except you. And he said, I hardly agreed with her request and called upon her often. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded into the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. Point number seven, a praying church is a powerful influence. A praying church may also expect to exert a powerful influence in the community it serves. Verse 33 says, And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. What would Bangor, Maine be like if all the churches were closed next week? What would it be like if the churches stopped praying totally? Would not Satan's influence explode? Listen to this story. D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody once entered a tavern in order to ask the bartender if his two little girls might attend his Sunday school. He was told that an atheist club met there every, Tuesday, every Thursday night and the owner of the bar was in no mood to offend them. Moody looked into the face of this man and pleaded with him on behalf of his girls. Finally, the man's heart was touched and he said, Preacher, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you'll come down here Thursday night and meet with the boys in a joint discussion and, and win, you shall have the, the children. But if not, the deal's off. Moody said, I agree. He went right out and looked up a crippled newsboy who really knew how to pray and said to him, Tommy, I need you next Thursday night to come with me. When the hour of the meeting arrived, Tommy and the evangelist entered the saloon. It was full of men sitting on whiskey barrels, beer kegs, and even on the bar eagerly awaiting the coming debate. Moody began by saying, gentlemen, it's our custom to open our meetings with prayer. Tommy jumped up on the barrel. Tommy, lead us in prayer. Tommy jumped up on the bear, bell and began to pray. Tommy began to beseech the Lord for the soul, all the souls that were present. 
As tears began to roll down the little fellow's cheeks, the most tender heart of the men began to leave the bar. Finally, after even the hardest men present began to leave until there was no one left except the bartender. Moody and the praying boy. Moody turned to the father and said, I claim your girls for my Sunday school. The bartender answered, all right, you win. But that's a queer way to fight. And Moody answered, that's the way I've won every battle I've ever fought. Hallelujah. Pray in church. Amen. Somebody, a boy that knows how to pray. Somebody that knows how to pray. The early church was a praying church. It also had great grace. A, a praying church can expect grace to be upon all its people. Look at verse 33. And great grace was upon them all. Grace means blessings, favor, delight. God loves a praying people and will shower upon them His special gifts. No wonder the New Testament church grew. They were a praying people. Can we be the same? What a force for God and for good would we be if we all began to pray. If all of us prayed an hour a day, Jesus said to his sleeping disciples, What? Couldn't you watch with me one hour? Is it possible for you to find an hour a day in your busy schedule to pray? If you could pray one hour a day, I'd like for you to stand. I'd like to see what God needs to say tonight. I want you to look around you. I hope you're all here tonight. I hope every one of you are here tonight. We're going to have a, an awesome, awesome service tonight. Richard, you can't pray an hour a day? 15 minutes. You what? 15 pray minutes. An hour a day. You can pray 15 minutes? How many hours a day do you breathe? All the time. How many? All the time. No, no, no. How many hours? 24. Oh, 24. But you can pray 15 minutes. Well, you may be seated. Tonight, I'm going to bring you from the World Network of Prayer some prayer sheets of things to pray for right. that will direct your prayer. All right. And it will show you how to pray and, and become a prayer warrior. Praying, uh, praying for the city of Bangor and, and different things to pray about the city of Bangor. I'm going to tell you, we're going to enter January in revival. You know, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to teach a lesson. I'm going to teach a lesson Wednesday night on, have I taught you how not to win souls? I, I did some praying in retrospect. Have I taught you how not to win souls? Was I taught how not to win souls? Don't go visit sinners. Don't spend any time with a sinner. You might get contaminated. Don't do this and don't do that and don't do this and don't do that. You are only as much a Christian as you are in your heart. No more Christian than you are in your heart. If I've got to, I cannot legislate to you holiness. Right. And we have tried to do that for years. My pastor, on and on and on, tried to legislate holiness. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. <clears throat> you know, I don't need the Bible to tell me don't commit adultery on my wife. I love my wife. Love keeps me holy, keeps me pure. It keeps me, the thought don't even come to mind to be unfaithful <clears throat> to that girl. I would never hurt that girl. I've even prayed, Lord, I'd rather die than ever to hurt my baby. <laughs> I mean, she's so precious. She's so pure. She's so... 95% of the goodness that I have, anything that's good in me, it's because of her. 
You know, so, you know, no. You don't need a law or a letter to tell you not to do that. You know, when you love God, you're going to serve God. You're going to talk to God. Prayer is simply talking to somebody you love. How many love God? Look around, look around. Prayer is simply talking to somebody you love. We sing, oh, how I love Jesus. You know, do we really love Him? How much time do we spend with Him? One hour a day. What? Jesus said, couldn't you watch with me one hour? And I'm not talking about come to the church, that you have to take time out of your schedule to come to the church and pray. If you want to do that, that's fine, but you don't have to do that. You know, I'm going to encourage you, wherever you live, to, to spend an hour in prayer every day for the month of January. I know this is going to be kind of hard for you. I'd like for you to fast as much as you possibly can. At least three days a week. If you can. Three days a week. And let me tell you how I fast. I fast from break fast to break fast. In other words, I eat a good breakfast, which is the most important meal of the day, and then I don't eat again till the next breakfast. You, you'd be amazed at what that will do for you physically, and, and what it'll do for your health, and how and it'll, it'll help you. So I'm going to ask you to also add some fasting to that, if you possibly can. You say, well, I work. I can remember kicking carpet and fasting. I was asked to come and preach somewhere. And uh, I fasted the whole week till Friday. I was going to preach on Friday. First time I ever preached. And I, I went to that church and preached. He had a, an evangelist coming in and the evangelist couldn't show up for some reason so I went there and preached. Five people got the Holy Ghost. Cataracts fell off on the floor of a woman's eyes. And, and, and God moved. We baptized all of those people. And I told that Ohio board, when I met the Ohio District Board to get my license to preach, they said, what if we decide to not give you a license? I said, that's your choice. <laughs> you know, that's up to you. You don't have to give me a license because you don't anoint me. God anointed me. And, and whether you give me a license or not, I'm going to do what God called me to do. Bottom line, got my license. God's a good God. So, anyway. Can we become a praying church, a praying people? It's not as if we don't pray at all. I, I know we pray. I know there are people here that pray every day. But I'm talking about I'm talking about focused prayer. I mean, you know, we pray at the beginning of our service. We pray pastoral praying, benediction. We pray during Sunday school as we begin. We pray uh, at our meals. We pray for church gatherings, prayer chains, and so forth, offerings. But what if we would pray for the whole month of January and fast again as much as we can. What would happen in 2019 at Apostolic Lighthouse Church? What would God do in our midst? I believe that revival would break out as it never has before. Yes. This church was the second fastest growing church in the United Pentecostal Church the first year I came to Bangor. Hello. Because I poured myself into this church. And that's what I'm going to do this coming year. I'm going to pour myself into this church. Not district events, not here, there, and everywhere, but this church. Because I believe Jesus is coming. And I believe if you're going to go with Him, you've got to not just be in the church, 
But you've got to have the church in you. And I'm talking about His church. He's coming after His church. It's got to be in you. It's got to be your, your life, your hope, your commitment, your living. Praise God. Any comments, questions, I got prayer? <clears throat> All right, sit down. Okay, so uh, in the book uh, by Frank Darwin uh, called Azusa Street, and, and the whole uh, Azusa Street revival which a lot of us attribute to Brother Seymour with his head in a peach crate frame. But it didn't start that way. It actually started with a handful of people in uh, the Peniel campground. They, they called them the Peniel boys. They were just young men. And they, uh, they all began praying. And they were looking for God to do something. And Frank Bartleman became a part of that prayer group. And and so did I know a couple of other preachers and people did, and they went from <laughs> church to church. You have to read the book to just understand how Azusa Street Revival actually came to fruition. It was over a year that uh, of, of prayer, foundational prayer, that finally broke in Azusa Street. At the same time that the Azusa Street Revival was gearing up, if you want to call it that, in Wales, there was a great outpouring, a great awakening across the whole nation of Wales. And there was a guy that was ahead of it, his last name was Roberts. And so, and there were also other places in America where people were beginning to seek the face of God for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Although they didn't really understand what they were asking for because God was leading them to that. And so all these men were, were corresponding with each, with each other. And Frank Bartleman wrote a letter to this guy, Roberts in Wales, and says, what do we have to do to get the results that you're having? And his answer was very simple. He says, all you have to do is get a group of people that will focus and pray and seek the face of God. That this, he basically said, this is the recipe that will work for all men at all times in all places to see a move of God. And that's what we are. That's what we're doing right now. Yeah, this, this is, yes. and it's not just for a month. No, 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 that's no. right. You, and, but we, if we set ourselves to seek the face of God this way, God will respond. That's right. That's it's right. the will of God to do this. That's right. Right. Yeah. It's His plan. Come on. Amen. In all fairness right. to you, I only said a month because I didn't want to stagger your minds. <laughs> if we do it for a month you'll be ready to receive the rest of it <laughs> if, if, we, if, if, if we will get as God is directing if we will yes. for one month do what God is asking us to do you'll be able to handle the rest of what I'm going to address to you you could not do, deal with it today some of you would probably walk out here this morning <laughs> That's called us to revive us. A, fa a, a factual and fervent prayer of the mouth. Of a righteous man. Of a righteous man. Okay, a righteous man is God's righteousness, right. and that's covered. That's right. We're baptized in Jesus' name. We're filled with joy. We're righteous. It's His righteousness. So, effectual. Can you speak? Can, what is effectual? What do you say when, it's, when the Bible says effectual? What is effectual? Is it, it, it you know? Uh, it, 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 Usually cause and effect, it's usually after. Okay, effectual, that root word effect is usually effectual and cause, a effectual and fervent prayer availeth much. So fervent, I mean, I, I, I kept that fervent. Fervent is like, your fervent is like, it's a fervent. I think that's pretty much, uh, go ahead. Yeah, that, that's not now I lay me down to sleep. No, 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 no. That's spiritual, that's, that's fervent, that's heat. He is Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost fires. I don't have time to. So, oh, I'm not going to. I, 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 I'm tempted to give you a little bit more, but no, I, I think I think we do this 30-day thing. I, I think you'll be ready to, to for the rest of what I'm going to give you. You know, all you have to do is read history. Read history. And, and you will find out when, when the people came over 
from England over to this country and, and how they had church and how they prayed and what they what they did. Okay, I know this is probably elementary school, what I'm going to say, but I think that we overlook this every day. God gives us opportunity every, every single day, day. Yes. To, to talk, to open our mouth and say it, yes. and we don't. A lot of times we have that opportunity and we let it slip by. Perfect example. Last week I was at the gym, and I got on the first treadmill and it wouldn't work. So I got on the second treadmill, and I'm hoofing away, and all of a sudden this man pops up on the broken treadmill, and I said, just to let you know, that's not working. Well, I said, you put behind me. Maybe. maybe it's just me. I've got that kind of luck. Sure enough, he hits the buttons and it starts moving. Yeah, you have to turn it on. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so we're, walking, we're walking next to each other for a couple of minutes, and he strikes up a conversation and mentions, uh, I don't know how it turned out, that he was a pastor of a particular church in a particular neighborhood. And I said, oh, wow, I didn't know there was a church over there. And he's like, oh, yeah, and we keep walking, and I thought to myself, now, wouldn't this be the opportunity for him to ask me where I go to church and to invite me? Uh, you know, and I thought, like, how many times have I overlooked the exact same sort of opportunity? Saying. Absolutely. And then, invited him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. But you're dismissed in Jesus' name. Uh, remember the service tonight is at 6, 5.30 prayer. I encourage you to be here. There's going to be some commitments made tonight. God bless you, be friendly, greet one another.